Hi guys, this is Mike from PNC Engineering, www.pncengineering.com. We are the U.S. distributor and authorized component level warranty and repair center for the United States. So, I thought I'd show you the Rig Expert Stick Pro today. This is a relatively new analyzer that's just come out from Rig Expert. Uh, this analyzer is an amazing analyzer for the value and, uh, well, also for its compactness and uh, usability. The analyzer is relatively uh, weather resistant. Uh, it has the ability to uh, stave off some of the um, uh, weather in that it has a rubberized cap that covers up the end connector on top of the analyzer. It also has a protection over the USB-C port that you can see here and it has a lanyard connection so that you don't lose your portable analyzer while you're using it out in the field. So this particular analyzer it also has a color screen on it and uh, a very uh, very concise amount of buttons on the front you just have your minus plus your arrow left right your stop and uh, start multifunction buttons uh, again it has color screen and it fits in the hand very easily quite small uh, this analyzer is a uh, analyzer that was uh, made after the other model similar to it called the stick 230 the stick 230 as you can see is very similar in its size to the stick pro uh, as a matter of fact they're exactly the same size and um, the parallax error of the camera makes them look like they're slightly different sizes but in fact they're not uh, the stick 230 however has the paper display where when you turn the analyzer off it in fact doesn't actually turn the screen off on the stick pro it does turn off the screen when you shut the unit off so um, the stick 230 although it seems like the battery is still being used it is not because like a kindle display for example the paper display just never shuts off it's an lcd it does not have a backlight on it uh, but it has very good capabilities in direct sunlight because uh, it's an LCD. However, the uh, Stick Pro antenna analyzer does have excellent uh, pixels, uh, or rather amount of pixels on the screen in such a small area. So it's able to be seen with its high contrast and brightness in, in direct sunlight as well. Uh, certainly uh, uh, outside when you're working field day or some other event soda operations maybe or uh, or some other camping trip etc so let's talk about the size of the analyzer first uh, here you can see this is the uh, AA55 zoom as an example and uh, this analyzer here uh, although it's compact fits in the hand and is easy to use uh, this analyzer here is considerably larger than the Stick Pro, uh, in that it's about uh, it's about twice as large, if not uh, uh, a third the size. Uh, the um, the Stick Pro is about a third the size. So, for example, uh, if I were to take the Stick 230 next to the Stick Pro and put them on the AA55, we see that uh, the height or length of the Stick Pro is about uh, just slightly smaller than the 55 and as you can see uh, as it sits on top of the 55 it's uh, still two of them are just slightly smaller than the 55. Now uh, those who are familiar with the AA230 and if you're not here it is uh, the AA230 is of course slightly smaller than the AA55 as well. This has uh, got about the same size screen but it has uh, an even more compact uh, size to it as well. So this is great for a go box too if you're interested in a uh, full screen 
size analyzer with all of the features that the uh, Stick Pro has with, uh, um, with its compact size. Now, if we were to compare the Stick Pro to the AA230, we could see it's about half the size of the AA230. And of course, if we put two of the stick analyzers on top of the AA230 uh, zoom, we can see here that should we line up the top of the uh, connectors to the AA230 uh, zoom, you'll see that the Stick Pro is about the same length as the AA230 zoom. And then looking at the size comparison, we can see that the AA230 zoom is twice the size of the uh, Stick Pro as two of them fit perfectly on top of the AA230. And then of course, uh, the 55 being slightly wider than the both of those. So excellent analyzer for compact size handheld operation with a really nice brightness screen. So let's talk about the features of the Stick Pro. The Stick Pro is very similar to the AA650 zoom in that it covers from 100 kilohertz up to 600 megahertz continuously, both in graph and static mode. It also has the time domain reflectometer and it has the coax tools that the 650 shares. Uh, this is available on all of the zoom analyzers with the exception of the AA35 and 55 not having the time domain reflectometer, although the AA55 does have the coaxial tools. One of the things that does differ between this unit and uh, all of the other zoom units uh, is the multifunction. On the AA230 Zoom, for example, you have what's called multi-SWR mode. In the multi-SWR mode, you get up to five frequencies or five bands that you can measure SWR simultaneously. So in this case here, you see we've got uh, 80 meters, 40 meters, 30 meters, 20 and 15 meter band frequencies typed in. And when I hit the uh, the launch or a start button, you'll see that the analyzer is simultaneously measuring the SWR of all five of those bands at one time. In this case, we have a dummy load and it happens to be a good dummy load. So we see that we have a 1.0, uh, in some cases a 1.0 to 1 uh, SWR uh, or 1.01 SWR that is. So uh, the AA230 has this feature as well as the AA55 through AA2000. Now, if we look at, for example, the Stick Pro, it doesn't have this function exactly the same. In this case, the multi-mode here using the plus sign to enter that mode, you'll see that what it will do is it will scan through all of the bands. Uh, once it's done, it tells me that I have no resonant uh, antenna on here. And of course, that's the case because I have nothing connected to the end connector. So if I put that dummy load back onto this antenna analyzer and I hit go again, it will once again scan through 17 bands in the ITU region two. And you notice that within a matter of about 15 seconds, we get through all 17 bands. In this case, we ended on the last band that we viewed, which was the 30 meter band. So as you see here, I can use the arrow left or right to go down to the first one, which is the 2.2 kilometer band. And it shows me that I have a 1.0 to 1 SWR at the frequency of 136 kilohertz or 0.136 megahertz. Moving up, I see we have the 630 meter band with a 1.0 at 479 kilohertz and so on and so on. So we can see the lowest uh, SWR measurement for which frequency on each of the bands. Now you'll also notice here that there are stars. The stars are very similar to a movie rating or a product rating where you would give a review of how many stars out of five. In this case, it's measuring the antenna. So 
if you have an SWR below a 10 to 1, then it will tell you by rating of stars how good the SWR is. In this case, of course, on the 15 meter band at 21.435 megahertz, we have a 1.0 to 1, so we clearly have five stars. If we should have, say, for example, a 1.2 to 1 SWR, perhaps we would only have uh, four stars or three stars out of five. So the star rating is dependent on how uh, good the antenna is with SWR for that band. If, for example, you have a multi-band vertical antenna, but it only does uh, 10, 15, and 20 meters, then if you were to put this on and scan, you would not see each of the bands with a 10 to 1 SWR, but it would ignore all of the bands that were not resonant and it would only display where the SWR was good within the three bands, 10, 15, and 20 meters that your antenna works on. So within 15 seconds, you can get a really good idea of what the lowest SWR is for each of the resonant bands on your antenna. A great way that you can make measurements in a quick view. Although different than the five bands or five frequencies simultaneously, a 15 second measurement gives you up to 17 different bands in ITU region two, all with the lowest SWR and on what frequency they are. So you don't have to have a fixed frequency you're checking for because it will tell you automatically where that lowest SWR dip is for each of those bands it's resonant on. Another thing that you can see in the screen, if you look at the very top, you'll notice that there is an icon here for the Bluetooth. This analyzer comes free with the Bluetooth connectivity so that you can use it with iOS, Apple device, or Android. Uh, it's an easy connection to an Android or iOS device. Simply turn it on, launch the application or the software on your computer, and then it will connect and you can make all of the SWR reactance, resistance, impedance, uh, all of those things will be scanned in a graph mode for you just as they would on this analyzer. Okay, moving on to the next feature, that would be HAM. So I will use the arrow to the left to select that mode. And when I do, what you see is it's making a scan of the 40 meter band. And we know this because it says at the top of the display here, 40 meters. At the bottom of the screen, what you see is I have a 1.00 SWR at 7.12 megahertz. So it's telling me at the bottom of the screen exactly where my lowest SWR is. And the graphical display is representing the full range of the 40 meter band. So the bars on the left hand side, as opposed to the bars on the right hand side are indicating 7.000 to 7300. Now there is a little bit of reading within that shaded area as well which drops below the 40 meter band and slightly above. That way if you have a dip that happens to be below or above the band it will catch that as well. But uh, in this case we see that uh, the SWR is best at 7120 and it's indicating that. Now, if I want to move to the next band, I simply use the arrow uh, to the right and it will jump to the 30 meter band. And again, it will measure the 30 meter band plus a little bit to the side. Now, in this case here, uh, you can see that the 30 meter band covers 10100 to 10150 megahertz. But you'll notice that the red line is off to the left hand side in that shaded area. So this is a good example of how you can see that the SWR is best at 1.0 to 1 at 10.06 megahertz. So it's uh, below the 30 meter band where it finds the best SWR and that is indicated by that red dashed line to the left in the shaded area. So let's talk about the free mode. In the free mode, it's very similar to the ham mode. In this mode though, you can change the frequency and the bandwidth of a scan. So here on the screen, we see we're at 7.15 megahertz plus and minus five megahertz bandwidth. So that would be five megahertz below the center line and five megahertz above the center line. If I wanted to narrow this scan, I can change the bandwidth by pushing the minus button and I can see that I'm going as low as 5 kilohertz. 
So now my scan is 5 kilohertz below the line in the center and 5 kilohertz above the line of the center. So in this case, it's telling me at 7.150 of my center frequency and 5 kilohertz bandwidth scanning. I see I have an SWR of 1.0 at the center line, but I also have 1.0 at the red dash line to the right of the center line. So if I wanted to figure out where exactly that dip was for the second point, I can use the arrow <clears throat> I can use the arrow to the right button and doing that it will change the frequency up by 1 kilohertz, make a new scan, and I see now that it's after 7.150 but before 7.151 megahertz. So uh, although I can't land exactly on top of it, I can see that I'm very close within 1 kilohertz of the dip. So again, I'll move down and we'll notice that the red dash goes to the right. So in this particular case, because they're both 1.0 to 1, it's very hard to narrow in on it, but I can see I have two dips. I can also see that the center frequency is a 1.0 as indicated here, and I also have the 1.0 on the red line. So this mode here, again, I can change both frequency and also the width of the bandwidth. Okay, so switching to page number two, I see that there, there's a setting called boundary. If I go into that mode, then what it's going to show me is the SWR at 147.15 megahertz, which is the last place we left off. And when I have a SWR that is outside of the boundary that I've preset, then what happens is the unit shows a red box in the center underneath the SWR. In this case, because I don't have a varying SWR, I can see that when I pull the antenna off, it shows me I have infinity, which is well outside my boundary limit. To set the boundary limit, I just go into this mode here, and then I can tell it anything above 1.5. I'd like to see it uh, indicate with red. If I put that boundary limit at a much lower level, say for example uh, 1.2 to 1, then when I go into my boundary limit, if I can slightly take the antenna off, you see that when I get to a 1.02, I've, uh, I've gotten to the boundary limit and it sees that, so it indicates it with a red background. Uh, it may look white on the, on the video here, but it's in fact a very uh, pinkish red indicating that the boundary has been met for the SWR. This is a great way if you're just trying to do a quick check on your antenna and you want to make sure that you're within the boundary limits that you set for your antenna. If you are outside the boundary, then you'll easily see that with a red indication on the background. The next tool that we can go into is the TDR or time domain reflectometer. And the TDR, what it does is it goes out and it checks your coax, similar to a submarine ping where it sends out a signal, it's returned back to the analyzer, and with that information, it can identify any anomalies within the cable, whether they be capacitive reactive or inductive reactive. So we can see if there's a short or there is an open somewhere within your coax. And if there is, as you move the cursor over, you'll see where that anomaly occurs, and it will tell you in feet or meters at the top of the screen, depending on whether you're set to imperial or metric, whether you have a anomaly uh, and at what footage it is located. So this is a great way of checking an antenna. And you can see that you have impulse and step responses that you can see values of down here. Of course, we're on a dummy load right now and not a piece of coax, but if we were, we would be able to see if there was an open and a short and how far out it is. So let's take a look at RX mode. The RX mode measures two things, the resistance and the reactance. The top red line sitting around the 50 is red, and it says at the bottom, their reading is 50.03 
ohms of pure resistance with a reactance X of minus 06 capacitive reactance at the frequency indicated above 143 2.50 MHz. So if we wanted to move the scan so that it looked at a less wide area, we could of course move the plus and minus and say for example, bring us down to a 500 kilohertz scan. And again, we see in this case, the center frequency, we have 50.03 R with an X of 0.02. If we had resistances that were well above the uh, 100 ohm area, the analyzer is capable of changing the scale level so that we can go either lower all the way down to uh, 20 ohms and then up as high as 1000 ohms. So this will give us the ability to see both capacitance and reactance in levels from minus 1000 to an upper area of plus 1000 ohms of pure resistance and inductive and capacitive reactants. The analyzer also has the ability to take a look at re the return loss by itself as opposed to being measured along with an SWR. This works very similarly to the SWR mode or the free mode on the analyzer, where here we can see we have a return loss at 143.250 megahertz of 68.9 and, and uh, at the red line a 74.6 uh, return loss. Now this is measured in decibel and this is slightly more accurate than SWR, but generally only used by broadcasters for the most part. On our third and final screen, we see we have a measurement called stub T. The stub T is a stub tuner. This is where you would use this mode in order to find out a frequency of a piece of coax in a quarter and half wave stub match. So in this case, we have a short piece of coax connected to the analyzer, and we can see as it runs, it tells us that the end of the coax is open as opposed to connected to a load or shorted, and it tells us that a quarter wave length would be a 54.763 megahertz uh, stub, or on a half wave stub, it would be 107.21 megahertz. So this is a great way if you're making phased verticals or trying to make a stub match for a vertical antenna that has uh, maybe a high capacitance uh, at the at the feed point and you need to make half or quarter wave stubs. This is a great easy way to do it and instantly find out what frequency your coax is cut for. Looking at CLEN, that would be our cable length. So if I select that mode, the first thing it tells me is what is the velocity or ask me the velocity factor of the cable. Assuming this cable is a 0.66 velocity factor, if I hit go, it will collect that data on the coax connected and tell me in this case it's 2.96 feet long. And in fact, this is a cut jumper that is three feet long. Uh, I believe that maybe somebody made a small mistake when they were cutting the cable or perhaps they uh, put the PL259 or end connector on the end of this cable and they messed it up so they cut the cable one more time to try again and when they did they shorted the cable just slightly. Now if I already know what the um, if I already know what the length of the cable is I can tell the analyzer that this was a three foot piece of coax because I'm certain of it, then it will tell me that the velocity factor of this cable is 0.67 in fact and not 0.66. So this is a great way to m measure the velocity factor of a cable or the length of a cable if you know the velocity factor. Each of them can be modified and selected by changing them individually. So you don't have to measure the coax incorrect with the incorrect velocity factor before you uh, change the length. You can go right to length, change it, and then make the measurement for velocity factor. So a very easy and efficient way to find the length of a cable. Another great feature of the antenna analyzer is the cable impedance or CIMP listed here. And when I go into that mode, it's going to tell me the impedance of a coax cable. 
this impedance is important if you have a coax that you don't know if it's 75 ohms, 50 ohms, or whatever ohms it may be. So the first measurement it needs to take is an open circuit on the cable. So that would just be a coax with nothing on one end. And I will run that data. It'll be collecting here. And once it's done, it will then ask me to put a proper short on the end of the cable. Now, in order to make a short on the cable, it's important that you don't use a jumper to make that cable connection or that short. Because if you do, then you're using the length of the cable as part of the calculation. And you want to avoid that at all possibility. So with a short on the end of the cable, I'll hit go again and it will measure the data and then it will compare it with the data that it collected without any short and just an open. So here you see it's made a graph and it tells me at 300 megahertz, I have 34.1 ohms of impedance. Now this coax should be good around the uh, one megahertz to 30 megahertz range being the type of cable it is. And I could see that at one megahertz, it is indeed 52 ohms. So not exactly 50 ohms, but many coaxes are not. So as I move up, here's four megahertz, and you can see I have 52 ohms of impedance. Six, eight, 10 megahertz, 12 megahertz, 14 megahertz, 16. So as you see, we're holding pretty close to 52, 53 ohms. So clearly as we get to 26 megahertz, my coax is starting to fail pretty bad as far as impedance being close to 50 ohms. Um, you'll find that many cheap coaxes in the United States can be as high as 68, 70 ohms. It's pretty incredible how uh, some of the inexpensive coax is. Now also, you'll notice on the side of the scale here, you have from zero to 180 uh, ohms of impedance. That is adjustable because you may have a coax that has much lower impedance. And here I can set the scale to 50 ohms and see uh, where these 50 ohm marks are. Or I can go as high as the 180 ohms to look for coax impedance in that 180 ohms. There are some coaxes like digital coaxes where there'll be 120 ohms and that'll be normal and you'll be able to make measurements on those as well and you'll be able to see uh, at what frequency they are that uh, impedance. Just as with the cable impedance, you also have a measurement for cable loss or C loss. In order to do that, once again, we'll collect our data using an open circuit on our coax. And then once we've collected all the data for that, it will once again ask us to make a short at the end of the coax. And one more time, I'll uh, caution you, do not use a jumper like an alligator clip with uh, a piece of three foot wire lead on it because it's going to add to the actual measurement. So making a complete short straight from the center conductor to the braid, I'll then collect more data for that and then it will do its comparison between the open circuit and the shorted circuit. And then it will tell me with a graph from one kilohertz to 300 megahertz, what the loss is of this coax. So once again, I can move the frequency down to the frequency I know it should be in between the one and as we discovered 26 megahertz area, I should have relatively low loss. So as you see here, this coax has a 0.08 dB loss at one megahertz. And as we continue on through the frequencies, we're holding pretty good at a 0.08. Now we've hit that 26 megahertz mark and you see we still have a good low loss on this coax, although we already know that the impedance has slightly changed and is going up. Now it looks like there's a bump here and let's find out where that bump is. That bump uh, hit us at 48 megahertz, where we see we increased it by 0.01 dB loss. And then we drop back down, we're going up to 0 0.1, 0 0.9, and then as we increase. With this piece of coax, it's better for HF, so as we move up into the higher frequencies, you can see that our loss factor becomes much greater. So we're at a half a dB loss. Now, if I were using this piece of coax, and I had seen 2.71 dB loss, and the indication of frequency at the top here was within the HF 
radio frequency, I would know that I don't want to use this piece of coax on that frequency for fear that I've almost lost half of my signal just in the coax alone. So this is a great feature to measure both coax impedance and coax loss from 1 megahertz all the way to 600 megahertz. So one of the things that I wanted to mention to you was regarding the uh, graphing modes. All of the graphing modes are able to be done in a single graph measurement or you can make measurements of a graph in a continuous mode, meaning that you can have the analyzer, uh, the, you can have the analyzer making its graph over and over and over again and that way you can see uh, if the antenna is changing as you're graphing. So when the SWR is blinking as it is now, it means that the measurement is going to be made continuously. So you may notice there's no antenna connected, but at the top of the screen where the 10 to 1 SWR is, you may notice there's a little flashing going on as the measurement continues to go. And until I hit the stop, the SWR will continue in a loop mode so that I can see changes that are happening. So in this case, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take off the piece of coax that I have on there connected to nothing, and I'm going to put a dummy load on. And what you'll notice is the SWR will immediately drop and then come into play, now scanning over and over. So you can see that change that happened in the, uh, in the mode where we're continuously looping. So that's a great feature if you're making adjustments to an antenna and you want to keep sweeping it over and over. And of course that sweep will be as wide as you've got the setting at the top here, in this case 10 megahertz plus and minus of the center line. Of course I can move that and lower it as low as I want or as high as I need to go and it will continuously make that loop. Uh, and you notice that I did that while it was still scanning. So you can both change frequency and you can change the uh, bandwidth of the scan while it's in a continuous loop. So if you see something where you had an SWR that was much lower to the left, you can be uh, you can start lowering the frequency as you see it's changing. I could be lowering that frequency by one kilohertz steps and uh, chasing after my lowest SWR in a loop mode. So a very handy feature. So in conclusion, this analyzer has a lot of functions, some of which I didn't even cover, but this gives you a good general idea of the, the Stick Pro. Uh, again, you have a lot of availability for adjusting user settings. We can turn the Bluetooth on and off if we want to save the energy of the analyzer. The analyzer also has uh, different modes. In this case, we're using a yellow text. I'm sure, again, it's a bit hard to see that it's yellow. Uh, here's a mode where it's a light blue with a white background. Again, I'm sure it's not easy to see uh, on camera. Uh, we can change it to a red with a white background, a light orange with a white background. So you have a lot of different selections that allow you to uh, see in different contrast modes. Perhaps you have uh, vision impairment. In that case, you'll be able to uh, reverse the image. Uh, we can measure in both imperial and metric settings. Uh, we can have the timeout of the analyzer turn itself off automatically at different time intervals. We can set that ITU region, as I mentioned earlier, you can change it to the different uh, ITU regions, Europe, Americas, and uh, Asia. And then this is the band search. I spoke to you about the uh, multi-mode where it sweeps the bands. We have the normal and the deep scanning that you can do. Uh, that changes the plot pointing on the each of those modes so you can get a deeper scan when you're making your multi-search. Uh, the analyzer can be calibrated so that you can calibrate at the feed point and exclude coax, a great way of making measurements. You can change the impedance of this analyzer so that its native impedance is 12 and a half, 25, 28, 37, 50, 75, 100, 150, 200, 300, and 450, and 600 ohms. That way you can work with ladder line and have native impedances at 600 or 450 ohms for ladder line and see everything at an SWR of one to one. 
uh, cable velocity factor is just your standard velocity factor that you set to always start with. Um, of course, we can set and reset the, uh, the, all of the settings to factories. Now, this has clear slots. The reason that it says clear slots is because this analyzer can also take measurements in SWR reactance and resistance and save them to memory. Those can then be uh, reviewed at a later time, or they could be taken back to the computer, plugged into the computer, and then downloaded into the computer using our software. So uh, some really great features, again, that I didn't mention. Um, so again, analyzer is very compact, easy to hold, weighs uh, just a few ounces, has a very bright uh, screen, and, uh, and is very accurate, I have to say. So I would definitely use this for field day, for traveling, uh, in your go box. I take it out with me if I were doing uh, soda trips up into the summits on the air. Um, great, great analyzer. Uh, pretty rugged. You could probably drop this a few times uh, without any damage. And uh, again, the screen is able to be seen because of its high contrast and brightness and because the uh, size of the screen with its pixel rating. Um, this analyzer is available from rigexpertusa.com or PNC Engineering, our company. PNC Engineering is both the U.S. distributor of Rig Expert products and an authorized component level troubleshooting and warranty center. So we cover your analyzer for two years. If you have any problems, you're welcome to send it back. If we don't swap it out with a brand new one, should it have a manufacturer problem, we will absolutely be able to repair it for you. And uh, our technical and operational telephone, email, and live chat window support is available for free to our customers. Unfortunately, we cannot serve as customers of other vendors, so you want to make sure that you have your purchase at Rig Expert USA or PNC Engineering, and that will give you the opportunity to call, email, or live chat with us and ask any technical or operational questions that you may have. All right. Guys, if you're interested, I would suggest you grab it. Right now, the price on this analyzer, I believe, is $399, an excellent price, uh, especially considering that the uh, AA230 zoom, which only goes to 230 megahertz, is uh, about $369, or rather $399 with the Bluetooth uh, option on it. So... Uh, you're getting a really good bang for the buck on this analyzer. So again, thank you for watching the video. I hope you've gotten some good information out of it. And if you have any questions for pre-sales, you're welcome to give us a ring. You'll find our uh, contact information on www.p as in Paul, n as in Nancy, c as in Charles, engineering.com. Again, that's www.pncengineering.com. Thanks, and we'll see you later. 73.